You can go to your children's church, okay? If you want to get out and go to that, you're only going to be in there about uh, 45 minutes today, okay? Some of you are thinking, boy, how's he going to get through this? Good thing I have a short sermon today, amen? Some of you are thinking, yeah, right. Thank you, choir. If you have your Bibles this morning, if you'll turn with me quickly to Romans chapter number 12. And I only do have just a few verses this morning that we're going to look at. Lord willing, tonight uh, we begin to look at the believer's responsibility to the government. And so hopefully you'll come back tonight and we'll look at that as the time we have tonight. But Romans chapter 12, we're going to read in just a moment verses 17 through 21. I want to make a few comments about that. But we've been looking in chapter 12. It's really the vision there in the book of Romans because we've seen the doctrinal and the uh, theological portion. Now we get into the practical, the application part. And here's what we need to do. It's living that spirit-filled life. It's Christian guidelines for Christian living, uh, living as a redeemed people in a fallen world. And as I mentioned many times, I've been mentioning over this the last couple of weeks, we as Christians, we're to be different and we're to make a difference. Amen? We're to be different than the world and we're to make a difference. We're to do the things that God has called us to do and live the way that he wants us to live. And, you know, when you look at this, as we looked last week, beginning with verse 9, if you look at some of those items there, Grade yourself on those. How are you doing? Let love be without dissimulation. Let love be without hypocrisy. Do you hate, abhor that which is evil? Do you cleave to that which is good? Do you love what God loves? Do you hate what God hates? Are you kindly affection one to another with brotherly love? Do you love others? Do you show concern and compassion to others? In honor, preferring one another. Not sloth on business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. How would you grade yourself on these? Would it be an A, an A minus, a B, a C plus, a D minus? How would you grade yourself? Because these are things to become more and more like Christ. That we're not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds and so that we might do what God has called us to do and live the way he wants us to live, and that we might not only be different, that we would make a difference in the world. And then he goes on in verse 12, says, We rejoice in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality, Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. You know, this is a great time for that verse. Amen. Those who weep, we weep with them and we show comfort and concern and compassion and, and we weep along with those who have had a tough time. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceit. So these are just a few things. Here's how we're to act, to behave and and look at those, and how would you grade yourself? Or are you doing those things that are making you becoming more and more like Jesus Christ? Because what we see here, we see in, the, in chapter 12 what we're to offer. We're to offer our bodies, ourselves, our whole beings to God. What we're to avoid, and that's worldly contamination. What we're to achieve is godly transformation, becoming more and more and more like Jesus Christ. If you'll pick up with me in verse 17. Just a few verses here. But a very powerful uh, portion of scripture right here. It says, recompense or repay return to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, you know what? Those are hard passages, aren't they? Just a few passages right here, but they pack a very powerful punch. Because it's things that, you know, we need to really sit down and examine our lives sometime and examine our hearts. Are, are we really doing these things? Are we really following these things that the Lord wants us to do, as Paul writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? You know, we can learn all about the Bible. We can have this theological stuff in our heads, and, and we can have this doctrinal, uh, these doctrinal things in our head, but are we practicing that? Are we practicing what we preach? Are we living that, and are we living our faith? As I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, the darker the world gets, the brighter that Christians and the church should become. Amen? That we need to shine our light, that we need to not only be different, but we need to make a difference in our world. We live in an evil and a wicked and a sinful society today. But we don't give up, just as Abraham in our Sunday school lesson this morning. He interceded on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah. He prayed, Lord, if there's just so many righteous people in this nation, please spare them. And God said, I will do that. But he got down to 10, and there weren't even 10 in there. 
But that's what we need to do. We can sometimes criticize and complain and, and fuss about everything. But you know what? Sometimes we need to get on our knees and we need to get on our faces before God. And we need to pray for the corruption and the evil and the wickedness and the sin in this society today. That's what we need to do. And not only pray about that, but we need to make a difference and go and share the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ with other people that people might be saved. Because you know, as we see this week, you never know when your life is going to be over on this earth. Did you know that? You need to be prepared. You need to be ready. Did you know that? I mean, we have people that die in their 90s and their 70s and their 30s, earlier than that. But are we ready to face our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? I hope you're ready. I hope you're prepared today. As Paul says here in verse 17, he says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. And you know what the sad thing is where it says don't repay evil for evil. You know what, folks? Two wrongs don't make a right. And the thing about it sometimes is when people have mistreated us and criticized us and wronged us and hurt us and, and insulted us, whatever it may be, you know what we do sometimes? Instead of praying for those people, we try to get back at them, don't we? We want to retaliate. We want to take revenge. And when we see something bad happen to someone who's wronged us or whatever, you know what we do sometimes? We say, that's what they deserve. God's getting them. I'm glad that happened. But let me tell you something, folks. That's not a very Christ-like attitude, is it? We pray for those people, okay? Pray for your enemies, as he says right here. And you know when it says here, recompense to no man evil for evil. You know what we need to do sometimes? We need to think before we act and think before we speak. Did you know that? We need to do that sometimes. Because sometimes we say things that we wish we hadn't said. We do things we wish we hadn't done. And then we make a fool out of ourselves. And, and, and we, we really mess up. And it hurts our witness and our testimony for Christ you know I mentioned a few weeks ago some people come to church because of you did you know that some people see your life and they say I want to emulate that life I want to model that life that person is a good Christian person and, and boy they really have it together and I want to be like that person I want what they have and they come to church because of you but you know what the sad thing there's some people who do not come to church because of you now if you notice I looked out through here I didn't look at anyone okay did you get that? But, but you know what? They know how you act. They know how you behave. You're not following these guidelines for Christian living. You're not living as a redeemed person in a fallen world. You're really no different from the world. You're blending in. You're conformed to the world. And you're really no different. Going back to Sunday school day, you remember Lot? He went to his son-laws and said, hey, you better get out of Sodom. What did they say? They laughed at him. They mocked him. His life wasn't what it's supposed to be. He was a bad witness, a bad testimony for the Lord. They didn't believe him. So how can you go out and invite someone to church and tell someone about Jesus when you're living like the devil of hell every day? You can't do that, can you? Would it be different? Would it make a difference? Another thing here says provide things honest in the sight of all men. There's nothing worse, folks. Listen here. There's nothing worse than a dishonest Christian. Did you know that? We're to be people of integrity, people of honesty, that our word is good, that we're, that we're going to be honest and truthful in whatever we do. We don't cheat on our taxes. We don't steal money. We don't steal this. We don't do that. But we're honest people. And, and people know that we are honest people. Because one little thing you do, people are going to see that. One little bad thing you slip up, they're going to see that. And that's going to hurt your witness and your testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why these guidelines are in the Bible. That's why they're written here. That we might not only learn these, but we might practice these. And we might do these things that we might be better servants and better Christians and brighter lights in this community, in this society, in this world right here. Then we go on to verse 18 quickly. It says, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, as much as it depends on you, leave, live peaceably with who? All men. Did you get that? Underline the little word all. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. The fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Love, joy. Don't you know the verse? Peace. Love, joy, peace. We're to be peaceful people. We're to make peace and keep the peace. And you know the thing about it, and let me give you some advice here. The cause of conflict must never arise from a believer, okay? We need to keep the peace. And you know what that entails sometimes? Listen up. Sometimes in order to keep the peace... You need to keep your mouth shut. 
Boy, people look at me bad now. But you know what? Sometimes we have to get the last word in. I have two sons. They don't live here. And my wife knows exactly where I'm going with this, okay? But I have two sons, and I'm not going to call out which one. Because one day they're going to have to put me in a nursing home, and I want to go to a good nursing home, okay? <laughs> but the thing about it, one of our sons always had to get the last word in. Always right, always knew better, always knew this. Of course, it gets back to selfishness. And I'm talking about when he was seven or eight. He's a little older now, okay? Still does it. <laughs> Somebody pray for me, amen? But I love him, okay? But the thing about it, that's how we are sometimes, and that breaks the peace. We have to get the last word in. We have to have the last say. How many of you know people like that? Say amen. How many of you are like, no, never mind. But the thing about it, we have to get the last word in. And we're always right, we always know better, and we always know what's best, and if we don't get our way, we're going to throw a fit. We're going to mess up the peace. And you know what? Sadly, that happens in church. Sometimes churches I've been in, once again, I'm going to look up here and not look at anyone, but there are in churches what's called troublemakers. You ever heard of them? You ever been one? Good, I didn't want to hear anything. But you know what? They're not happy unless they stir up trouble and there's trouble in the church. Do you know that? That's why churches split many times. They, they're not happy unless there's trouble. When everything's going good and people being saved and people joining the church and everybody's happy and loving and crying with one another and rejoicing with one another, they don't like that. But boy, you tell somebody, hey, we, we, we've got a, we're going to have a business meeting tonight we're going to have a knockdown drag out. Do you know that? And we're going to have a cage match in here and we're going to fight. That's a wrestling term, okay? You, we're going to fight and fuss and carry on. You know what place is going to be full, isn't it? Because we like trouble. And there's people in your churches, they like trouble. If there's no trouble, they're not happy unless there's trouble. We need to keep the peace. Sometimes that means, hey, we don't get our way. We, we need to keep our mouth shut, whatever it may be. But let me tell you something quickly. We're never to sacrifice the truth for the sake of peace. Are you with me? We're never to sacrifice the truth for the sake of peace. Let me tell you what that is quickly. That's if, say we had a group in the church that said, Pastor... We don't like you talking about Jesus as the only way of salvation. We believe there's other ways for salvation. And in order for there to be peace in this church, you better start preaching that there's other ways of salvation. If not, there's going to be trouble here. If you want harmony and unity in the church, here's what you need to do. Folks, peace, peace is not worth it there. Did you know that? We can never sacrifice the truth for the sake of peace. But the Bible says here, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. That's what we need in the world. We need peace among one another, and especially in our churches. Verse 19, dearly beloved, avenge not yourself. Don't take revenge, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. You know those saying there, I don't get mad, I get even. And that are what we want to do sometimes, retaliate. And we want to seek revenge. Let God take care of this. God doesn't need our help. He doesn't need our advice. And let me tell you something. God will repay at the proper time and in the proper manner. Because the right to judge and the right to execute vengeance is God's and God's alone. And the day of his wrath is coming and it will be inescapable. Those wrongdoers, one day they're going to answer to God. People think sometimes, boy, I got away with that. They didn't see me. I got a light sentence. I got a light this, got a light that. But let me tell you something, folks. One day you're going to answer, these people are going to have to answer to God. Did you know that? There's no escape. There, there, there's no escape. And God is not only love, but God is a just God. And God will punish sin because you look at the cross. He put his son to death because we had sinned against him. So the day is coming, so we don't need to worry about that. The right to judge is God. Let God take care of this. We're to be different. We're to make a difference. In verse 20, therefore, if thy enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Basically what Paul is saying here, this was an old Egyptian tradition. They'd carry a pan of charcoal on their head as a public act of repentance. And Paul is saying, look, show your enemy kindness. Make them feel ashamed. And maybe they'll come and repent. And they'll come and say, you know what? I'm sorry I wronged you. I'm sorry I hurt you. Because many times we want to take revenge and we want to retaliate. And we want to get them. And we want to show that we're macho. Did you know that? I was coming home the other night. I wasn't going to tell this. But since I've only got about 30 minutes, I'm going to tell it. I was coming home Wednesday night after, uh, after church. I was cutting across Goggins Lane there in Richmond. And 
there was a car in front of me, and it never fails, you know, when you're hungry and you haven't eaten hardly all day. You get behind somebody going 10 miles an hour. Have you ever been there? I'm behind this car going 10 miles an hour. It takes me two hours to get across Goggins Lane. And I'm cutting across there, and here comes this big pickup truck with bright lights. And they get right on my bumper. And I kept thinking, Lord, I'm a preacher. Lord, I'm a preacher. You know, I'm going down this hill, and I kind of hit my brakes there, and a the guy kind of screeches there, okay? And he kind of backed up there. And then I got on Tate's Creek going home, and he kind of whipped around me. And the first thought I had was I pulled in my subdivision. I'm like, I'm going after that guy. Some young punk, I'm going to go and show him a lesson. But I thought, next thing I need, Richmond Register, Bria Paper, Pastor Assault, young man or something, okay? <laughs> and I didn't want that. I still need a job, okay? But, but, but the thing about the first instinct is what? I'm going to get back at them. I'm macho. I'm a man. I'm going to get back at them. And I'm, I'm going to show that kid a lesson. And I, I believe if some young kid may be a friend, they probably didn't mean any harm. But I just didn't like that, them on my bum. I couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't do anything. And the first instinct was, I'm going to pull and go do something. But I thought, you know what? My wife needs me. I don't need to do it. But these days and times, you, you can't do that. You never know if they have a gun. You never know what they're going to do. They're going to rob you or whatever. And I'm sure it was harmless. But first thing is, and then I got to think, I've been studying this. Vengeance is God's. If your enemy hungers, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Now, I don't know if that particular time, if I'd pulled that truck over, I'd give him something to eat or drink. <laughs> but the thing about it, then I got home and I thought, boy, I'm glad I didn't do anything stupid. You know, you have to pray about that. We, we encounter things like that every day, don't we? And we have to be different. We have to make a difference. And, and, and you see there, if you turn with me quickly to 2 Kings. Turn with me quickly to 2 Kings chapter number 6. 2 Kings chapter number 6. And there's a story where there were some enemies of Israel, the Syrians. And, and they were captured. They were blinded. And then they, then they regained their sight. And look in 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 21. Says the king of Israel said unto Elisha when he saw them, My father, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? These were the Syrians. And he answered, Thou shalt not smite them. Wouldst thou smite those whom thou hast taken captive with thy sword and with thy bow? Set bread and water before them, that they may eat and drink and go to their master. And he prepared great provision for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away and they went to their master. So the bands of Syria came no more into the land of Israel. Do you see that? Elisha said, no, don't punish them. Don't hurt them. Don't harm them. Let's feed them. Let's show them kindness. Let's be nice to them. And, and you see the thing about it. Don't try to destroy your enemies with violence, but try to convert them with love. You know what? Evil can be overcome by good. Did you know that? Evil can be overcome by good. We see a lot of evil in our world today. Would you agree with me? A lot of sin, a lot of wickedness. But you know what? There's still a lot of good people out there, amen? And it can be overcome. Evil can be overcome with good. You look at the cross. Man, Satan thought he was doing evil to Jesus, but it was overcome. Jesus was doing good. He was paying for the sins of the world. There's a great African-American scientist by the name of George Washington Carver. Most of you have heard of him. He said one time, and I quote, I will never let another man ruin my life by making me hate him. I'll never let another man ruin my life by making me hate him. Lord, folks, we're not to hate others. Did you know that? I don't care who they are, what they've done. We're not to hate. In our community this week, you know what? We may have a lot of hate in our hearts, don't we? We may have a lot of bitterness and anger in our hearts, but you know what we need to do? We need to get on our face and pray before an almighty God and leave everything in God's hands. Amen. That's what we need to do. Jesus said, pray for your enemies. Love your enemies. Pray for those who despitefully use you, do good to them, bless them. Look in Matthew chapter 5, that verse 44. He says, love them, pray for them, do good, uh, bless them. This is what you to do. And that's so hard to do, isn't it? But you see, only a mind renewed by God and a heart transformed by God can do that. Because in our human nature, we want to get back. That person deserves this and that person deserves that. But folks, as Christians, we're called on to love. Jesus Christ from the cross said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Look at the last verse quickly. Verse 21, Romans chapter 12, says, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. That's hard to do, isn't it? 
Amen? That's hard to do. But don't let evil conquer you. And don't let evil defeat you and overwhelm you. But the way we react to evil is we do good. You know how to get rid of an enemy? You say, preacher, I know a lot of ways I can get rid of an enemy. Best way to get rid of an enemy? Make them one of your friends. Did you know that? And they won't be your enemy anymore. Pray for them. Love them. Help them. Show Christ before them. That's what Jesus did. Jesus had a lot of people didn't like him. But he loved them. He cared for them. He prayed for them. He went to a cross and died for them. If Jesus can do that, folks, surely we can do it also. See, the believer takes vengeance. Then he allows evil to conquer him. Let me close with this. God is on his throne. And though not all may be right in the world, listen here. He is the one who will avenge the wicked and reward the righteous. But you know what, as we look at these passages here in chapter 12, and I know we've gone quickly through verses 17 through 21, but going back to verse 9, you know what all these things entail? It entails a devotion and a commitment to Jesus Christ. But let me give you this, and we'll close on this. There's a lot of people who have made a decision for Christ, but they've never made a commitment to Christ. Are you with me? A lot of people made a decision for Christ, but they've never made a commitment to Christ. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Folks, there's a lot of evil in our world today, isn't there? There's a lot of sin, there's a lot of wickedness. And you know what? We as Christians, we can stoop down, and we can join with them, and we can get on their level. But God has called us to live on a higher plane. God has called us to love our enemies, bless them, pray for them, do good to them, feed them when they're hungry, give them something to drink when they're thirsty. And our human nature, I don't know about you, but I don't want to do that, do you? I don't want to do that. But if we have a heart and a mind of Christ, we'll do what Jesus wants to do. You know what, when you think about it, when Jesus died on a cross for you, were you a perfect person? Amen? Were you a saint? You never committed a sin, never committed a crime, never did anything. But Jesus took his life and he died on a cross, the suffering and the pain and the agony for sinful human beings like you and like me. And you know what, if Jesus can forgive and Jesus can love and Jesus can show compassion, folks, we can do the same. What we're to offer our bodies, ourselves, our whole beings to God. What we're to avoid is worldly contamination. And what we're to achieve is godly transformation. Folks, if the world knew Jesus, it'd be a different place. And I like that song. People need the Lord. Will you bow with me today? Father, we are thankful. Lord, we're thankful for our passage of scripture today as you've led us to this passage to read. Such appropriate time. As we seek forgiveness, we seek healing. In our lives, the lives of our churches, the lives of our communities. And Lord, help us as always to never give up, to pray. To be the witnesses, the testimonies that you would have us to be in this dark world. And Lord, we realize that our world seems to be becoming more wicked and sinful and evil. But as it does, Lord, help us to shine even brighter. As we've seen in our community over this past week, we see there's still a lot of good people. There's a lot of good Christian people. A lot of people have been praying. A lot of people have been on their faces begging you and pleading you for your mercy and your grace. And, And, Lord, it's good to see that. And it's good to know that churches are united praying in these matters. Father, I pray today if there's one here without Christ, we realize that's the greatest need. For a person to come to Christ believing that he died for their sins, was buried and rose again. And Lord, help us today because we never know that appointment with death. We never know when that's going to be, but help us to be ready. Help us to be prepared that when we leave this earth, that we're going to be with you. As Paul said, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And he said to be with you is far better. And absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Father, help us to be prepared and ready. Help us to share that, to live that and to do what you called us to. Bless our time of invitation today. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What number, Brother Gary? 153. Number 153. Will you stand with me this morning?
Somehow, some way, God speaks to your heart today. Whatever it needs, you need to respond. This is your time to respond, your time to come. Be my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Amen. Good to have you with us today. And uh, I've been blessed today. Amen. Mm. Hope you've worked it well today. I've been blessed. Now, don't forget tonight, 545. You have some singing, and we want some people to be here.